In this lecture, we will discuss bit boards. A bit board is a data structure designed to efficiently encode a game board state as a set of bits. The concept was first used in computer chess in 1977. As has been the case with the bit sequences we've looked at thus far, instead of using a bunch of individual integers to represent the state of each board position, we can use a single bit. The three main advantages of using bit boards includes bit boards being able to encode the board state more efficiently than a single integer per cell, that you can read and write from the bit board using bitwise operations, and that the bitwise operations pretty much run like parallel processing because they can be applied to all the board cells simultaneously. For an 8x8 game board, the bits can be stored in a long integer that has a length of 64. Whenever there is a 1 in the binary sequence of the integer, that indicates a state of the corresponding cell. For example, the first 8 bits of the integer will relate to the top row of the board, with each storing the state of a single cell. Because bit boards can only store ones or zeros, you need separate bit boards for differing states. For example, a bit board that records where the white cells of a chessboard are would look like this, where the ones signify the positions of the white cells. Likewise, as you will see shortly, we would also need a bit board containing the location of the black cells that would look like this. Looking at just the first row of cells from each, because it's easier to fit it on the screen, you will see that one is the bitwise not of the other. We will call these two bit sequences masks, as you'll see shortly. And the game board need not only be for chess. You might have a game board that requires several bit boards to define the location of, say, resources. In this particular game, Bunny Kingdom, there are six resource types in the cells. In this case, you'd need six separate bit boards to define the locations, one for each resource type. But we're going to stick with a generic black and white board to simplify this discussion. So let's say you've got this black and white board, but you've also got two players. One is red and the other is blue. The positions of each player would be stored in a bit board. The bit board for the blue player would look like this with ones in the positions of the player's pieces and zeros everywhere else. And this would make the red player's bit board this. To find all red players on the black squares, you could use a bitwise AND between the black bit board, we defined earlier, and the red bit board. The places in the binary sequence that would have a 1 are shown as crosses here on the board. So how do you think you'd find the blue pieces that were on the white squares? That's right, you'd use a bitwise AND 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 together the white bit board with the blue bit board. How could you find the locations of all of the players? Well, you could do the same thing. You could AND together the red with the blue. And then the opposite of that, how would you find all the spaces that are left on the board where there's no players? Well, remember we have the NOT operator. So if we NOT red and blue, we will get the opposite. And therefore we will get ones in all the positions where there are no pieces. Now bit boards are pretty useless unless we can put values into them and get values out. Let's start by putting a value into a bit board. Let's say the blue player puts a piece here. This is in row 1, column 5. Remember we always count from 0 in computing. Which value does this represent in the bit board? We've been showing the bit board as a square of numbers, but in fact you need to remember it is a single integer and therefore quite one dimensional. So we have a board that is two-dimensional and a binary sequence that is one-dimensional. If you've worked with a lot of two-dimensional arrays in the past, you might be familiar with a technique called array flattening. That's where you basically unfold the two dimensions and place them into one. The index into the array is calculated with row multiplied by width plus column. So instead of number, row, column in an array with eight columns, we use number row multiplied by 8 plus column. 
So this blue piece is going to be at the index in the binary sequence of 1 multiplied by 8 plus 5, or 13. Now, how do we get a 1 into position 13 in a bit board? Well, we borrow a little trick from our bit packing examples and left shift a 1 across to the 13th position. But we can't do this to the actual bit board in question as it will already be populated with other bits. So we need to make a bit board with just one bit turned on representing that single piece and then we use a bitwise OR to add them both together. So the method to perform this will look like this. I've called it a uh, set cell state and it's returning along. So it's returning the new bit board. Now it's going to accept a bit board, which is the one you're going to change, and the row and the column that needs setting. We then create a new bit board when in fact it's only going to be really one bit that is set to one. So we declare along and then I'm called it new bit in this case and we're equaling one as a long value left shifted by row multiplied by eight plus column. And then we return the bit board bitwise ORD with the new bit. Besides setting the cell state in a bit board, you'll also want to be able to get a cell state as well. All right, so how do you think you're going to do this? The code is very, very similar to what we've just written, but we have to do a slightly different test or a slightly different bitwise operation on it. So have a bit of a think about it and pause the video now. And I mean, have a really good think about it. I want you to write a method called get cell state that's going to return a Boolean value. It will accept a bit board and a row and column, and it's going to return true if the bit board at that row column is set to one, otherwise it's going to return a false. Okay, so pause the video now and think about it, write it down. Okay, how did you go? Did you get something similar to this? Okay, it's kind of similar to what we had before. So the mask in this case that we're going to use to mask the value that we're after is defined in exactly the same way as the new bit was in the previous one. But now we're actually going to bitwise and it with the bit board. And then if there's a one in the bit board and a one in the mask at the same position, then we're going to get a one. So it's going to return true or false when we test it against zero. How did you go? Did you get close to at least having the bitwise and? I hope so. The last thing I'm going to show you is a method that's very useful to use with bit boards. And that's a method for counting the number of bits that are turned on in a bit board. You might want to use this for calculating a player's score. For example, you actually might want to know how many of the blue player has its pieces on the white checks and then it gets extra points for that. So therefore you would do a count on the odd value between the blue and the white. So the method looks like this. In this case, I've called the method cell count. So you give it the bit board and it's going to return the number of bits that are turned on. Now, it's quite interesting when you have a look at it. What it's doing is it's keep looping over the value of the bit board that you have passed in. Okay, so you assign it to another long integer so that you can actually manipulate it. And then what we're doing is we're ending it with itself minus one. And each time we do that, it actually is reducing its value down and we do a single count of it. And so that loops around however many times it needs to until the uh, value becomes zero, at which case it's going to return the number of bits that are on. Now, I'm not going to go through that for you to prove it. What I'd like you to do is actually do it on paper because it's a very interesting exercise when you write down a binary sequence and then you start ending it with its value minus one. So remember that it's decimal value minus one that you're then making into binary and doing a bitwise and with. And 
it's quite astounding, interesting when you see the results on paper as it unfolds and how that algorithm actually works. Now, bid boards won't do everything you need to do in a game, but they will manipulate board states very quickly. If you're interested in learning more about bid boards or mathematics for games in general, check out my Udemy course. The details are in the description. Thanks for watching. Please support the development of more superb online learning content by subscribing. And as always, visit holistic3d.com to learn more about awesome games development books and tutorials.